everybody. We will be restarting our program for the uh, Unraveling Long COVID. And we will be initiating the session two, which will have uh, a few speakers from our multidisciplinary team. And we will start with Dr. Robert Schaefer, who is from Infectious Diseases, who will be talking to us about SARS-CoV-2 reinfections, as well as some also touch upon the uh, some of the questions regarding vaccines. And as we go through session two, um, thank you all again for your interactive comments and questions during session one. Uh, we did notice that some people put in, for example, you know, Dr. Meglis, could you answer this question? So actually, that would be helpful as well for um, our moderators as we're trying to do our live Q&As. If you do have a specific question for a speaker, feel free to note their name in that question, and we'll make sure to direct it over there. And um, we'll go ahead and go with Dr. Schaefer's speech, uh, talk right now. Thank you. Some of the most common questions that persons with long COVID have are related to the risks and consequences of getting reinfected with SARS-CoV-2. These are my disclosures. They are for the most part unrelated to the topic of this talk. This talk is organized around four specific questions. What are the factors associated with SARS-CoV-2 reinfection? What are the consequences of SARS-CoV-2 reinfection? How can the risk of reinfection be reduced? How can the consequences of reinfection be mitigated? There are four factors associated with the risk of SARS-CoV-2 reinfection. The risk of reinfection is increased with the time since one's original infection and or vaccination and with the emergence of new variants less susceptible to the neutralizing antibodies generated during past infections or vaccinations. The risk is reduced by minimizing exposure, if possible, and by continuing to receive recommended vaccinations. The figure at the right illustrates the risk of infection with the initial Omicron variant according to whether a person was previously infected with an earlier variant and according to the number of vaccine doses received. The figure shows that a history of previous infection or receiving three vaccine doses, which at this time were just targeting the initial Wuhan variant, was associated with an approximately 50% reduced risk of reinfection and that a history of infection and receiving three vaccine doses was associated with a 75% risk of reinfection. In this scenario, having received a vaccine booster, in other words, three vaccine doses, was much more protective than having received two vaccine doses at preventing infection with a completely new variant. I placed two additional more recent references at the bottom of this slide that examined these risks in large UK and US populations. On average, reinfection is associated with reduced severity compared to one's initial infection. However, those with a severe initial infection generally have more severe reinfections, presumably because they continue to have the same risk factors for severe infection, such as older age, underlying medical illnesses, obesity, or perhaps even a genetic predisposition to severe infection. Moreover, reinfections are not necessarily benign. A large VA study has shown that repeated infections lead to a cumulative increase in morbidity and new diagnoses. The risk of developing long COVID is reduced following an initial infection, but is still present. In the one study that examined this, the risk of developing long COVID was 4% after an initial infection. However, persons who did not develop long COVID following an initial infection still had a 2.4% risk of long COVID following a second infection. These data are from a variety of studies that I have listed below. The remainder of this presentation will be on how the risk and consequences of reinfection 
can be mitigated. The emphasis will be on vaccination, which reduces the risk of reinfection, the severity of reinfection, and likely the worsening of long COVID symptoms should reinfection occur. I will also review whether vaccination can directly impact long COVID symptoms. I'll briefly describe the indication for the recently authorized monoclonal antibody, Pemivibart, also known as Pemgarda, for pre-exposure prophylaxis, and the benefits of treating infections, reinfections with antiviral therapy. Vaccination reduces the risk of reinfection. There have been multiple large cohorts that have shown this, but perhaps most convincingly, it's been shown in heavily exposed persons, such as residents and employees of long-term care facilities, as shown on the left. Nonetheless, as evidenced by comparing the figure at the lower right with the one at the upper right, the risk reduction associated with vaccination dissipates more rapidly when a very different variant emerges. There is overwhelming evidence that vaccination reduces the risk of long COVID in persons who develop COVID. This slide contains figures from two of the largest studies that have demonstrated this. In the study at the left from the USB BA system, long COVID developed in 9.5% of those infected during the Delta era and 7.8% of those infected during the Omicron era. Among those who were vaccinated, the risk of long COVID was reduced by about one half to 5.3% in the Delta era and to 3.5% in the Omicron era. The second study shown at the right is from a network of eight integrated healthcare systems in the US. It showed that vaccination was associated with a reduced risk of developing many different categories of conditions more than six months post COVID. However, these data do not directly answer the question of how vaccination will influence the course of disease in persons with long COVID. First, the populations that have been studied consisted of those who had not previously experienced COVID rather than those who already had long COVID. Second, neither of these or other studies honed in on the classic long COVID symptoms of fatigue, post-exertional malaise, brain fog, and autonomic dysfunction. Nonetheless, these studies suggest that vaccine-induced mitigation of disease reduces a wide range of subsequent conditions and symptoms, and that it is logical that these benefits would apply even to those who have already been infected and have long COVID. There have been two systematic reviews investigating whether vaccination directly influences long COVID symptoms. The 13 studies included in these reviews have had very different designs. Most were case control studies, but several had no controls. Most relied on survey questionnaires while a few used healthcare databases. The outcomes measured in these studies were also highly variable. Some studies examined the effects of one dose versus two doses of vaccine. Most studies examined different symptoms. The heterogeneity precluded meta-analyses. However, overall, most patients had no change in their symptoms following vaccination. About 10 to 20% had improvement in one or more symptoms. A somewhat smaller proportion had worsening of one or more symptoms. My conclusion is that these data demonstrate that while vaccination likely does not improve long COVID symptoms, it is generally safe in persons with long COVID and does not lead to clinical setbacks. On the order of 1% of patients in our clinic date the onset of their symptoms to receiving a COVID vaccine. Perhaps the most reliable study on this subject is from Germany, which estimated that one in 5,000 persons receiving 
an mRNA vaccine may develop a syndrome similar to long COVID within the first several months after vaccination. In this study, the syndrome was associated with certain autoantibodies and elevated IL-6 levels, suggesting that this is a real phenomenon. However, even if these numbers are accurate, the risk of developing this syndrome is 100 times lower than the risk of developing long COVID following SARS-CoV-2 infection. Investigators from Yale have also recently published a preprint describing a cohort of individuals identified from an online community that described a syndrome similar to long COVID following vaccination. If a person with a syndrome similar to long COVID reports that the onset of their symptoms was definitely linked to vaccination, then this may be a small group of patients for whom routine vaccination should probably be avoided. I've provided a link to the CDC vaccine recommendations and two figures that contain a concise summary of these recommendations. It is anticipated that vaccines will continue to be recommended yearly for the general population, but, for that pers but that for persons at high risk of disease progression, two vaccinations per year are likely to continue to be recommended. In June, the FDA authorized a monoclonal antibody for pre-exposure prophylaxis for persons with moderate to severe immunocompromise. The antibody called Pem Pemivibart or Pemgarda is, is administered by IV infusion every three months. It is a re-engineered form of the monoclonal antibody adenotrevimab, which was shown to reduce the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection from 6.8% to 1.7% in a 2000 to 21 to 2022 study of about 2,600 participants who were at high risk of exposure and also at high risk of disease progression. PEMGARDA was more recently shown to likely be effective at preventing infection in an as yet unpublished randomized trial in which no infections were, re were reported in a group of highly immunocompromised persons. In this trial, there was a 0.6% risk of anaphylaxis during either the first or second infusion, and therefore patients receiving PEMGARDA require two hours of monitoring. I recommend Paxlovid for most of my patients with long COVID should they become reinfected. There have been many studies examining whether Paxlovid reduces the risk of long COVID, but none examining what effect Paxlovid treatment has for persons with long COVID who become reinfected. Overall, most studies suggest that the risk of long COVID is reduced by about 25% in persons who receive Paxlovid within five days of developing COVID symptoms. However, there are conflicting results. The two largest studies examining this analyze the same VA population. One found that in addition to reducing death and hospitalization, Paxlovid also reduced the number of post-COVID conditions at six months. However, the second study that employed different analytic methods found that Paxlovid did not reduce the risk of post-COVID conditions. What I find compelling, however, is that prospective data from two clinical trials, one of the SARS-CoV-2 protease inhibitor, Encitrelvir, which is approved in Japan, and the other of metformin, which was found to be beneficial in one trial in the US and to possibly have antiviral activity, found that the treatment of found that the treatment of acute COVID was associated with a greater than 20% risk of long COVID. Finally, I have listed two large case control studies below. The first showed a, a reduced risk of long COVID, 
The second showed an approximately 10% risk of fatigue and brain fog, but not of overall stud study defined long COVID among those receiving Paxlovid. Of note, each of the studies reviewed on this slide examined populations for which Paxlovid is currently indicated rather than for all patients with long COVID. In conclusion, the risk of reinfection increases with the time since a person's initial infection and with the emergence of a major new variant. It is decreased by vaccination, even if there is not a perfect match between the circulating variant and the variant in the vaccine. The severity of infection is usually reduced compared to one's initial infection. However, persons with severe initial infections are likely to have more severe reinfections. The risk of long COVID is highest after an, an initial infection, but long COVID can occur following reinfections and repeated infections can increase post-infection symptoms. Vaccination reduces the risk of reinfection and the re risk of long COVID in those who become infected. It is safe in persons with long COVID but it probably does not improve long COVID symptoms. Antiviral therapy during infection reduces the risk of disease progression in those with one or more risk factors for severe disease. It probably also reduces the risk of long COVID by about 20 to 30%. However, its effect on long COVID symptoms in those who already have long COVID has not been studied. Finally, pre-exposure prophylaxis with a newly authorized monoclonal antibody is recommended for persons with moderate to severe immunosuppression. <laughs>